Okay, so let's officially kickstart the, uh, the Dan Southern Africa webinar. Welcome. Uh, for the folks that don't know me, my name is Mornay Christo. I'll be uh, your host this evening. And um, yeah, I kind of run the things here at the Dan Southern Africa office uh, out of Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, just like to thank everybody for joining the webinar. I know that your time is valuable and I uh, hope that you're going to find the webinar informative. And uh, yeah, I trust that everybody's doing well and that you're safe and healthy and back in the water and diving. So our talk topic this evening, dive incidents and the lessons learned. Just a couple of basic webinar housekeeping rules just before we kickstart the webinar. You obviously found that you are muted and that your videos are turned off for the webinar. Now, uh, please use the chat box as most of you have done so far and just introduce yourself, tell us where you are in the world and also let us know what you're expecting from the webinar. That'll be quite interesting while we wait for more people to join. Mm -hmm. Now, during the presentation, please make use of the Q&A box to ask your questions and not the chat box. Um, you know, otherwise it becomes quite difficult just to keep track of all the questions you might ask. And if we don't get to all the questions, um, you know, just bear with us. We'll, uh, <clears throat> we'll address them in the follow-up email or hopefully during the webinar. Um, and then just for the folks that uh, maybe didn't, couldn't make it this evening or have to bail out a bit earlier, the webinar replay link will be available tomorrow via the Dan Southern Africa YouTube and uh, Facebook channels. So um, that'll be in the follow-up email that you'll receive. And then the folks that are joining by Facebook, great to have you on board. I hope you're going to enjoy it as well. And just a little word to say thank you for supporting Divers Alert Network. As you know, it's the world's most recognized and uh, respected dive safety organization. And as you know, when you join, Dan, it's not just about getting great dive accident benefits, but your support really helps our power our 24-7 uh, dive emergency hotline and advances our ongoing dive safety research training and education programs for divers across the world, which is evident uh, this evening. Now, if um, you're not yet a Dan member, you know, you can always join. You can visit uh, within the Dan Southern Africa region, the DanSA.org website. If you're in the States or Canada region, um, you can go to Dan.org. Uh, if you're from Europe, you can go to DanEurope.org. And the rest of the world, really, danwill.org. And if you're already a Dan member, please remember to uh, refer your dive buddies and thank you for your ongoing support. Now, let's meet our guest speaker. It's Dr. Franz Crenier. He is the founder of Dan Southern Africa and the former president and CEO. And uh, he's a medical doctor with a passion for dive medicine. Now, just a quick wrap up of what you can expect of the uh, webinar this evening. Um, as we know, learning from uh, your own mistakes and misfortunes uh, is critical, but don't miss the opportunity to learn from others. And that's really what the webinar will be and focus on uh, this evening. It'll be on real dive incidents and emergencies and offers an exceptional learning opportunity. And Dr. Franz Grenier will provide insights into dive incidents and lessons learned, which will help divers from all experience improve their risk management skills and identify dive safety practices or diving safety practices. Anyways, uh, that's it from my side. Over to Dr. Franz Grenier. I hope you're going to enjoy the webinar. Well, welcome from my side. It's, it's really humbling seeing so many people from all over the world um, showing their interest in what we're offering. And the title of the webinar is Diving Incidents and Lessons Learned. But what I'll be presenting will perhaps not be quite what you expected. Uh, not that that means that you should log out immediately. But instead, we're going to look at what is behind some of the unfortunate events and then um, show you a case right at the end that will bring it all together. So I hope that really will uh, whet your appetite. Uh, just to give you a quick overview, we, we're going to look at some of Dan's core values. Um, and you'll understand what I mean when I show you uh, why that's important. The difference between a hazard and a risk uh, 10 common mistakes divers make. I mean, I can show and discuss uh, 200 cases tonight, but better to show you what caused them and uh, discuss it from there. The three greatest fears divers have. 
A large study was done under green bubbles in Dan Europe, and it actually identified three of the greatest fears, and it wasn't what we expected. And then we go further and see what is the biggest difference we can make. A little bit of a discussion between decompression sickness and decompression illness, and then a case report that brings it all together and really shows you some of the clinical signs and things that we uh, get to, to deal with and um, some of the changes on the MRI and how we identify abnormalities. So let's start off with Dan's core values. And besides all the other things, the membership, the training, the uh, safety products, et cetera, et cetera, lies our desire to really create a culture of diving safety. And that's one of the things the study, which you'll see just now, really lifted up. And I think partly it's because uh, divers are uh, becoming more mature. The average age of, of divers is now 37. And uh, it may have something to do with that. And also because there is a greater understanding of uh, hazard identification and risk, and that we emphasize that both in diving, the resorts, the chambers, and that that has become part of the culture that we're establishing. Now, what is the difference between a hazard and a risk? Uh, we often use the terms synonymously, but a hazard is technically something that has the potential to co cause harm, damage, or loss. So it's something that has the potential. But for it to become a risk, we need to be exposed to that hazard. Now, that may sound like semantics, but let me just be uh, practical. We have a nuclear power station about half an hour's drive from here, and it represents a physical hazard related to radiation. But that's a hazard. If we look at the exposure, though, it's, it's less than the background cosmic radiation that all of us are exposed to. So the hazard does not become a risk until we become exposed. Closer to home, scuba tank pressurized to 200 bar. Well, that's a physical hazard, but it only becomes a risk if it has not been visually and hydrostatically tested or is mishandled. And so with diving, Although the process of diving involves activities and equipment, all of which are potential hazards, they become risks when we're exposed to those hazards. And that's what we need to differentiate. What is a hazard and when does it become a risk? Because the risks we can modify, we can mitigate, we can remove, we can address them. So we must first identify the hazard and then deal with the risk. So what are the chances of exposure? That's what makes it significant. What are the chances of exposure? The odds that if exposed, the injury would be high and that the loss or injury that ensues would be great. So something that explodes, but uh, almost never does, may represent an extreme as hazard on the one hand or risk on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's so rare that we wouldn't even uh, make specific provision for it, like uh, natural disasters, for instance. Uh, we plan to some extent, but, but that represents something that goes beyond, but they fortunately very rare. So my first question is, just looking at that cylinder standing there, is that a hazard? Or is it a risk? Well, while you're thinking, uh, just uh, look at a scuba cylinder. It's standing in the wooden shed. What will make it a risk? Well, if it falls over, that's not only a, a, uh, um, a risk because it might fail, but because it may fall on someone's foot. So if we don't look at the hazard we may sometimes not identify a variety of risks. Now, the worst case scenario would be rupture and explosion. But if we don't look at the hazard component, 
then we become preoccupied with the risk. And sometimes we overemphasize the risk rather than understanding the hazard. Now, I hope I haven't uh, hit that on the head too much, but understand the difference between a hazard, which is the potential, and the actual risk, which is the exposure that we would uh, be subject to. Now, as I mentioned, Dan undertook a study to make this not only theoretical, but practical. And this is the actual study. And part of the study was to look at what the general safety perceptions were, what the gaps were between what operators were telling scuba divers and were not understood, how to really educate people on the risks, and then to assess whether that education made any difference. Now I'm going to start off with some of the 10 most common mistakes that were identified. And there are no surprises here. So don't expect there to be surprises, but I'd like you to think about it in a different way. And I'm gonna start off with not doing buoyancy checks. <laughs> I mean, it is, yes, the most obvious thing. Are we wearing the right weighting system for the wetsuit, the dive gear and our physique? But think about it. The safety of our buoyancy compensating system as a whole, how functional it is. Power inflators, which are the single most hazardous element or component of the whole scuba diving rig. Are we really taking care that that hazard doesn't um, become a risk? And then the question of how our buoyancy changes, planning for the depth, the depths we are going to be diving at, realizing that we want to be optimally buoyant at that depth so that we don't continually inflate and deflate the buoyancy compensator, wasting gas and even suffering injuries. And although obvious, it is probably the single most common underlying cause of diving injuries. And I can quote innumerable cases that are basic to not doing buoyancy checks. And you can look at the slide and for each one of these very familiar elements, the compression of the wetsuit, the type of equipment from salt to fresh water, for each of them, I can quote a fatality, let alone an incident or an event. So it's so important that we are cognizant of the effect of just the two and a half kilograms of gas that we breathe out of our tanks and how that affects us. Going down, we have the addition to it, the additional two and a half kilograms, but by simply exhaling, we have an additional four kilograms on average that we can weight ourselves and become less buoyant. And that is a very, very effective way to go down rather than battling. And instead of overweighting ourselves, we can uh, use these variables that are at our disposal. And I know it sounds insignificant or even trivial, but if I look at the accidents and the fatalities, it really boils down to these simple things. The next thing is diving outside of your known limits. And we all know that people are trained in different circumstances and then end up diving uh, under conditions that they are not necessarily experienced in. And people check divers' logbooks if they're conscientious to see whether they have the necessary experience because experience often makes the difference. Now, they tend to say that uh, good results come from experience but experience comes from bad results. But rather than you learning from your own bad experiences, we hope that we can convey that from others. Lack of situational awareness. Uh, that's a very important one. 
this uh, this particular slide now i think you're looking at is lack of body communication you won't believe how important it is to understand the relationship between bodies there's an unspoken social contract between them and the bodies undertake looking after each other's interests and not acknowledging or respecting that social contract and leading to buddy separation often precipitates dangerous situations when unexpected uh, events happen, equipment malfunctions, or there's an out of air emergency. So divers owe it to their buddies to disclose potential health issues. It may be that you are willing to uh, accept the risks for yourself, but understand that you are also involving other people and that that is a social responsibility that you should deliberately undertake. The next one is lack or loss of situational awareness. We all become fascinated with the underwater environment, whether you're pho uh, taking photographs or just studying something beautiful or just moving from our two-dimensional world into the three-dimensional one makes an enormous difference. And being aware of our depth, your body, and your gas supply at all times represents probably the three most simple situational awareness issues that you could uh, really add to the, to the importance of diving safety not watching air consumption. I know it's simple, but we don't do it. And if we use our power inflator unnecessarily because we didn't have our buoyancy optimally, that can become a major issue. And it's usually one of attitude. So don't, uh, if you don't care, don't just stare. <laughs> you should care. And uh, stare at the right things, the things that will determine your safety. And then, believe it or not, many of the accidents, almost half, if not, not more, occur at the surface because divers don't fully utilize the equipment that's available to them to relax, inflate their buoyancy compensator, and if it's truly uh, an extreme circumstance, ditching their weight belts. It's amazing how many divers we find, tragically, um, that had a fatality and they still have their weight belts um, inside you. And if they drop that, the outcome may have been significantly different. I've mentioned this a number of times by now, using the power inflated too much because of the buoyancy issues that we didn't sort out. And if anything, the power inflator is the Achilles heel of scuba diving equipment. I can't stress that more, uh, more or enough. And then task loading. You know, task loading, we don't realize that when we dive, every single sense that we have, vision, hearing, taste, smell, and touch is completely deranged. And if you take a novice diver and you then require them to co concentrate on all the things that you've tried to train and drill into them, it's not surprising that there will be a significant task loading. And if you add on to that photography, navigation, let alone technical di diving, you really can get people into trouble. And if nitrogen narcosis is an additional factor, it can easily become life-threatening. And then this should probably be early on the list, not equalizing enough. This is the most common injury we see in diving by far. And in fact, two meters of descent is the equivalent of an airliner descending from a cruising altitude of 40,000 feet with a cabin altitude of 8,000 feet to sea level. 
but the aircraft does it over 20 to 30 minutes, whereas a diver does it in a few seconds. So equalizing in advance to buy you some time is half the battle won. And planning for the first three meters to really be trouble free by exhaling, relaxing, exhaling, and allowing that extra four kilograms of negative uh, buoyancy, if you like, to assist you in descending it can be a very, very simple, but a very, very important way of allowing yourself to descend gently and equalize your ears as you go. And lastly, but not least, we as humans have the tendency of doing either our own thing or acting in herds. Now, we've already spoken about doing your own thing and uh, becoming fixated on your own thing. But the latter problem is where we go into a sort of automatic or almost hypnotic mode and entirely relied on the guide for our diving safety and often their gas supplies rather than tending to our own. These 10 items may be obvious and intuitive, and perhaps I'm insulting your intelligence. I mean, just looking at the people joining uh, tonight, I, I am humbled by the wealth of international representation on this webinar, but I hope that I can really just drill down these 10 simple things that can make an enormous difference. And communicating them to your uh, dive students is really one of the investments that you can really make. Now, here's a surprise. What would you think just if you had to come up with the three greatest fears that divers had? Well, in the poll of about 4,000 divers from all over the world, the three greatest fears were the following. The first was, believe it or not, drowning. The greatest fear was drowning, either due to equipment failure or loss of consciousness. So an emphasis on the serviceability of diving equipment and clearly indicating the importance of maintaining a buddy system would address this fear directly or indirectly and be an extremely valuable input that you can build into your dive briefing. Just by addressing the underlying potential causes, equipment malfunction or loss of consciousness and the buddy system to assist with that. So it seems simple, but it is significant. The second greatest fear is suffering decompression illness. Now, whilst it's undeniably true that decompression illness is a risk and can't be completely eliminated whenever we breathe compressed gas underwater, one to four out of 10,000 dives may result in this malady. And even then, more than 90% of divers with decompression illness make full recoveries. So this is, again, an example of how a hazard and a risk can really be disproportionate. Yes, there's a hazard, but our exposure with divers, most divers, 80% in fact, staying in the safe zone means that that hazard becomes a very manageable risk. Sure, we take the additional advice, proper rehydration, doing safety stops, um, taking appropriate descent rates, uh, which means slightly faster at greater depths and much slower at shallower depths with the necessary stops, even further reduction in that risk. But isn't it amazing that this actually rare uh, uh, problem uh, is overrepresented as a concern just because we focus on the hazard rather than the actual risk. And then thirdly, boating accidents. Boating accidents featured 
very high on divers' concern lists. Depending on the dive vessel that they're diving on, getting on it, getting off it, uh, being seen where they, when they surface, avoiding propeller injuries, getting the necessary assistance to get back on board. All of these things can be covered in dive briefings and allay divers' unspoken fears. So please remember those unspoken fears that you can address extremely well and effectively in a diving briefing just by emphasizing uh, the issue of hazard versus risk and concentrating on the buddy system that goes a long way to avoid drowning, the decompression illness incidents that is very rare if you follow the rules and boating accidents that can be overcome by giving people good guidance depending on the dive vessel they'll be diving from. Okay, now just a quick overview about decompression illness versus sickness. Now, whenever we breathe compressed gas, there's obviously the potential for decompression illness. We've covered that. And whenever we ascend from depth after breathing compressed gas, there is that risk. But we can manage that and manage our decompression. And as mentioned before, this unspoken greatest fear can be managed effectively. Previous webinars have addressed the different classification systems, and I don't want to revisit them other than pointing out that the one on the left of the slide is the one that we use in research. When you've got all the facts and the luxury of looking back, and sometimes, as you'll see in the case I, I will be presenting shortly, we don't necessarily even necessarily know. And then on the right side, the clinical or descriptive classification, which makes provision for the change that may occur in a diver's presentation during the course of the development of decompression illness. And why I'm using dysbaric illness or gas bubble disease is because many languages can't really make a distinction between decompression sickness and decompression illness. So dysbarism or dysbaric illness or gas bubble disease may sometimes be more appropriate uh, for many languages. So I just wanted to point that out. Okay, now we can measure divers' exposure to uh, decompression stress by listening to their bubbles and their grades that actually show the amount of decompression stress. But even high grades, although associated with a high incidence of decompression illness, are not synonymous with decompression illness. And even then, a low number of divers suffer decompression illness. So that's using an auditory examination of a diver's heart after a dive. And then there are visual ways in which we are able to look at bubbles, do bubble contrast studies if there are concerns of a PFO. And what you're hearing now, and I'll play that again if I, if I can, let me just go back. You will hear during the course that uh, the, the sound, but you'll hear a very clear <laughs> which is the sound of bubbles going into this diver's carotid artery. Now, this person has me diving, and so they didn't suffer any harm. But this study you will hear again performed on the diver in the case that I present at the end of this, uh, this talk. So let me just play that to you again. Papapo, papapo, papapo. Those are bubbles, and they're going into the brain. 
But this person, Costastina Balestra, who is a good colleague of mine, is a neuro uh, physiologist, both before and after the test, okay? Because he wasn't diving and those bubbles were readily absorbed. But if a person's been diving and has a high inert gas load, even small numbers of bubbles can sometimes cause significant problems. So, if we are to diagnose decompression illness, what do we have at our disposal? Well, I'm sad to say that there is no single test that we can use to verify whether or not a person is suffering from decompression illness. We use indirect cues, we use the history of exposure, and we use the presentations that we become familiar with to, uh, uh, shall I say, increase the probability of it being decompression illness. But there is no diagnostic test. And chest X-rays, again, I'm sad to say, even though they're very valuable at looking at pneumothorax, because we, we don't want to put a diver with a pneumothorax in a recompression chamber, do not differentiate between arterial gas embolization and decompression sickness. Because many of the chest X-rays, including the case that I'll be showing you, were normal. In spite of a history that was highly suggestive, in this case, of uh, arterial gas embolization with breath holding. Now we can look at the target organs of decompression illness and maybe just use those because they will become relevant as we talk about the final case. And the first one is the skin and we'll talk about the lungs and then of course the brain and inner ear and then joints and so on. Now the skin lesion we are concerned about is the one that looks like this, cutis marmorata. It's a very, very distinct type of rash, which basically proves that bubbles went through the pulmonary circulation. It is evidence of bubbles going through the lungs, shunting through the lungs in many cases. We focus on PFO and atrial septal defects in many cases, whereas many shunting problems are actually through the lungs. And why I can say that is that cutis marmorata has been visualized commonly where ordinary patients, not divers, ordinary patients in a ward get a bolus of gas going into the venous system through the lungs and causing this exact same uh, rash. So this is evidence that bubbles went through the lungs and in fact were not eliminated by the pulmonary bubble uh, trap. So that just um, as a reminder of that. This is a condition called chokes where the number of bubbles are so exhaustive that they actually obliterate the pulmonary circulation. In the olden days, people used to die. It was, it was called Benke's sign. When a diver, after diving with a significant exposure, uh, uh, took a cigarette and basically um, had um, a, a bout of coughing and frequently ended up dying. Now, this was a very unique case. We uh, eventually didn't even um, uh, need more than a very simple treatment, and the individual did fortunately, extremely well. This slide is a slide of the brain. Now, technically, it's not particularly important, but basically an MRI, there are three stages of an MRI. The first stage, called the T1 stage, is where the, the liquid in the brain is white. And then there is a second one, a bit further along, called the T2 one, where all the liquid in the brain or wherever you're measuring is white. And then there is one that is in between the two. And what it is able to show, it's called the flare um, uh, investigation. It is able to show fresh lesions. 
And so where the arrow is pointing over here, over there and over there, these are fresh lesions and are evidence of gas embolism. These are individuals and fortunately very rarely do divers uh, die as a result of spinal decompression illness, but the top two were divers that uh, died because of the, the uh, decompression illness and the bottom one actually did not die as a result of the spinal decompression illness, but because their immobility, in other words, the fact that they couldn't move their legs, resulted in clot formation, which ultimately was released as a thrombus or a blood clot that ended up in the heart, and they died as a result of pulmonary embolism of a blood clot. But nevertheless, you can see the lesions on the spinal cord there. Now, having said all these different things about presentation of decompression illness, we have to also face reality. And reality is that 80 to 90% of symptoms manifest in the first six hours. I'm talking about first, first presentation. So if a person has had no symptoms whatsoever, not transient blindness, not transient feeling weird, not transient vertigo, not transient uh, paralysis, which often recovers spontaneously and is then written off as a non-event. It isn't a non-event, it is the first event. And those individuals can often, within the first 24 hours, develop additional symptoms. But it is unusual for first symptoms to present after 24 hours. And after 36, it's almost unheard of unless you combine it with altitude and if you are beyond 48 hours, then you are truly an exceptional individual and it's most likely something else. So time gives us some indication of the likelihood of a person suffering decompression illness. Now in the olden days, we very conveniently said that anything that happens before 10 minutes is gas embolism, and after 10 minutes is decompression sickness. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. This study um, by James Francis shows very, very clearly how an individual's, and DD means during decompression, IS means immediately upon surfacing, and then five, 10, 15, 30, 60 minutes, two hours, six hours all the way to 48 hours. And you can see that all these cases, and they were very carefully selected, a thousand cases, all of which were routine ascents and did not have any suggestion that uh, would uh, lead one to believe that they had a lung overpressure injury. So these are all people that surfaced, let's call it normally, presented with central nervous system uh, manifestations on average within, uh, uh, within 10 minutes, half of the time. You can also see, though, that after six hours, almost all the cases presented. No new cases really presented after then other than a few really oddball cases that uh, um, were exceptional and there were specific reasons for that. But the first six hours really are the, the most significant. Now, if we look at the spinal cord and the onset of decompression illness in the spinal cord using the same scale, we see, believe it or not, that the most cases of spinal cord decompression illness also occur within the first 10 minutes. And so we need to realize that we are dealing with different 
mechanisms. And that's really a very important take home message. And you'll see that with a case that I will be presenting. Initially, especially if you've been diving deeper than 80 feet or 24 meters for more than 30 minutes, then you are at risk of bubbles actually forming within the spinal cord. And that sometimes results in uh, bubbles that respond very rapidly to recompression. Or, unfortunately, the space that the bubble created is filled with blood and there is no response to recompression, even though it was started very, very soon. And that's why we have this inexplicable or previously inexplicable situation of divers sometimes um, recovering miraculously within um, a couple of minutes of recompression or really having very, very long and very complicated uh, cases of uh, a decompression, spinal decompression illness because blood probably filled those um, uh, particular areas created by the bubbles. Then after about 20 minutes or so, there are a whole host of potential causes, including venous stasis, ischemia, uh, further bleeding and edema. And if it happens really much later than that, you're dealing with a failure of the blood brain barrier and inflammation for the most part. And interestingly enough, the middle group, the middle group usually respond very well with one or two treatments and the last group responds very good with a single treatment. But sadly, this initial group may either recover very, very promptly or sometimes not uh, significantly at all, although over time there is fortunately a significant improvement. So if I can just hammer that down again, dives deeper than 25 meters for more than 30 minutes do carry the potential for gas bubble formation in the spinal cord itself. And that is a rapid onset situation. So now if we look at cerebral decompression illness, and you can see spinal decompression illness cases there, if we look at those affecting the brain, 75% of the cases already presented within 10 minutes. So it is not that easy to distinguish arterial gas embolism from decompression sickness because the 10 minute rule simply doesn't give you all the answers. And why not? Because it's not only rupture of an alveolus or a hole in the heart but it may in fact even be failure of the pulmonary bubble filter that causes venous gas emboli that usually shouldn't be a problem to ultimately arterialize and present as in a way that would uh, be similar to arterial gas embolism. And depending on where the bubbles go, we'll have the symptoms. And I'm showing you this slide deliberately because you will see that in the case I'm presenting. Um, let me just, it's just taking a moment to move on. While it's doing that there, you can see, I'll just go one back here. It's just the video that was loading. If I go back to the previous one, you will see here a taxia. This is the cerebellum or the little brain. And you'll see lesions in this individual and how the individual walks as a result. If the bubbles are in this area, then usually it affects the upper or lower limb and typically only one side. And in very, very rare cases, uh, almost um, impossibly, uh, you have embolization of both anterior uh, arteries and it may then resemble spinal decompression illness. But that is so rare that you could almost exclude that. 
Now, what you're looking at here is an experimental situation of a white rabbit, a New Zealand white rabbit, injected with bubbles in the artery. And what I want you to notice is how those bubbles actually disappear. They don't stay in the arteries. They are actually forced by an increase in blood pressure and forced into the brain tissue. And the reason for that is that the circulation of the brain is from the surface of the brain down to the white matter or the middle of the brain. So it goes from surface all the way down. And if you take a closer look, you will see that there is a almost a watershed area between what we call the gray matter, because it contains neurons that color gray and look gray, and the white matter that has these so-called candelabra structures. It looks like a, an old uh, opera house lamp. And those areas where the blood vessels make a 90 degree turn are the areas where bubbles get stuck, or in the case of cancer, uh, often are the place where cancers uh, are metastasized to. The way down, the blood vessels leave the artery at a perpendicular angle. So it's unlikely for a bubble to go in there. Uh, it's far more likely for it to get stuck at that juncture between the white uh, and gray matter in the brain. Now, if you have half a milliliter of blood bubble foam in this artery at the base of the brain. This is the cerebellum you're looking at, by the way, on both sides. If you get half a, a milliliter of blood bubble foam there, it's usually lethal because that area is um, responsible for breathing and heartbeat. Okay, so that does happen and can happen, but it is fortunately very rare, about one in a hundred thousand dives results in a fatality and almost half of those are due to either a heart attack or a stroke, not directly related to diving. Two more things and then we'll get into the case report. I'll give you a moment uh, for questions uh, after these two slides, uh, just in case there are some. If you see a pattern of loss of function and feeling that is girdle-like, then it is very likely to be a spinal cord related lesion. But on the other hand, if you see a very distinct part of a limb having especially a sensory deficit, it usually is a mechanical pressure on a very superficial nerve, either because of the equipment or how the person was sitting on the boat that has caused that particular presentation. And this recovers on its own, whereas the previous one that I showed you needs recompression. Okay, so that is just as a prelude to the case report. But before I get into that, uh, are there any questions, Mornay, that uh, maybe came up uh, as I was going through the presentation? Yes, there, there were some that uh, <clears throat> started off uh, uh, fairly soon, but I left them until uh, till the break. So uh, possibly you've answered some of them, but um, uh, I'll get, um, sort of read them out and see if you can answer them. Um, uh, uh, so I was just uh, one of the questions was uh, any incidents on rec penetration? So I don't think you have any of those just uh, for tonight, but that's something to consider um, unless you do have some hidden slides that I'm not aware of, uh, uh, Dr. Kunia. Um Well, rec penetration um, has to do with the disciplines, the gas use, and of course the depth that the rec is at. Mm. So I'm not quite sure what the question is, but in terms of fatalities, they represent a fairly small number um, because rec penetrations are usually um, fairly simple and, uh, and usually fairly shallow. Yeah. 
All right. Well, uh, next one was just, you know, will there be a certificate uh, after the webinar? Uh, well, I can answer that one. We haven't had any, uh, you know, need to present uh, certificates, but that's, you know, I guess something we can look into um, unless you've got something uh, to add to that, Dr. Grenier. Mona, yes. Well, professional educational units is something that is valued in many countries. Mm. And I think these webinars very definitely would fit um, that need. Uh, there is an application process to do that, of course. But I think that is a very, very valuable way to uh, get some additional um, benefit from attending these webinars. That's a that's a great idea and thanks for that prompt. Yes, okay. So something to address in the future. Uh, next question, statistically, what are the most common errors with experienced divers? Thank you in advance. Uh, what are the most common areas? Uh, no, uh, common errors with experienced errors. divers. Uh, the most common errors are overconfidence. And... <laughs> It's divers that have been diving for years and they have become so accustomed to their equipment that they no longer pay the usual attention. And you get rebreathers that are not properly primed. Um, you get, um, uh, oddly enough, divers getting lost sometimes mm -hmm. in tunnels and caves. And, uh, and of course, as I mentioned, uh, heart attacks and strokes uh, become more and more common the, the older the divers get. And with that, the more experienced uh, the divers get. But um, the 10 uh, common errors that I mentioned, um, uh, experienced divers are not immune to those. Mm. And uh, we've had a number of fatalities as a result of those seemingly very simple, very obvious uh, um, mistakes that divers make. So mm -hmm. I hope I answer that. Um, if not, I encourage you to look at the several uh, Dan diving accident reports that actually give you the blow by blow breakdown of the fatalities and injuries and the age groups in which they occurred. So that will give you a far bigger picture and a broader picture than I'm able to do in the time we have. All right. Just as a note, uh, I will be sharing a link to those uh, uh, reports that uh, Dr. Cronier mentioned. Um, next question or more statement, I guess, but um, it says, I also think getting guys to overweight on their first dive creates a bad culture of incorrect weighting. So that's just something to add, I guess, to the discussion. Yes, I think that that's a very, very um, potent comment. And one of the things that we can really encourage uh, student or novice divers is because of the fear of drowning, divers tend to breathe, the, um, if I could call it, at the upper range of their inspiratory reserve. Remember, we have a tidal volume, which is about one milliliter per kilogram. As you're sitting there watching this, you're breathing about one milliliter per kilogram. But when you're nervous about drowning, then you increase that inspiratory reserve and you then breathe at a higher rate, which means you're more buoyant. So if you can actually relax your students and tell them to deliberately understand that mechanism by simply exhaling, they will be able to sink. And uh, on average, it's a four kilogram difference. Mm. So um, uh, I would really encourage you to uh, add that to the instruction that you can give your students. Brilliant question. Thank you for that. Mm. So Dan Schultz uh, has two questions, and I think it uh, most probably has to do with the, um, uh, those 10 points that you mentioned. So he says, when it comes to you, um, the human factor, what do you think is the best way to remedy these issues and then he follows on to say um, does Dan have uh, health um, uh, and safety and environmental professionals that work for them because this is kind of right up um, our alley basically or their alley oh uh, I, I could give you a hug for that question because <laughs> that's exactly what Dan is about yeah. is is about really putting hazards and risks in context meaning that uh, in 
with dive resorts, dive operators, and divers themselves differentiating between hazards and risks and showing them what they can do. Sometimes mm. it's very, very simple things mm. that are necessary to eliminate a hazard mm. or at least mitigate it significantly. So mm. uh, Dan is absolutely invested mm. uh, in doing exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And uh, the study that I mentioned and uh, will give you the link to afterwards, uh, you will find a lot of surprises mm. uh, in what divers ultimately, how they think. Mm. Uh, but on the whole, we are becoming a more safety co conscious culture. And, uh, and I think that's a healthy thing. Mm. And I'm grateful for that. So uh, thank you yeah. for just pointing out those two issues. So, uh, Dr. Cronier, there's quite a few questions still, but uh, maybe we can address another two or three, and then we can move on and then, um, you know, address the, uh, the other questions uh, towards the end of the um, webinar. Is that fine with you? That's fine with me, Mornay. All right. So, Simone, um, he, uh, or uh, the question and kind of a uh, statement question is, um, dropping weights, how does that compare between conscious and unconscious divers? Are there any stats on that, um, uh, if I read the, the, oh. the question correctly? Um, I would have to give you an average because, of course, the report on fatalities varies from year to year. Mm. But what I can tell you is that about 80% of diving fatalities have their weight belts uh, still in situ. Mm. And uh, Part of the reason or part of what goes along with that is, of course, the body recovery, because if the person didn't ditch their weights, then they usually drift down to the bottom and it mm. becomes a search and recovery issue. Mm. Whereas if they did drop their weights, then um, it's often that they float at the surface or near the surface and uh, so are more likely to be recovered, even though they may not necessarily have survived. Mm. But it's at least 80%, if not more, sure. that leave their weight belts in situ. Yeah, okay. So um, the next two questions uh, is from Greg, and um, it, it has to do with lung shunts. He wants to know uh, how common is this in people? And then the follow-up question, um, is there a test to confirm lung shunts? Oh, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, that's great questions. Okay. Um, well, the, the first thing I need to tell you is we don't know. That's, yeah. Okay, that's, that's the first part. Because we don't know, for instance, what the prevalence of patent for Amen of Ale is. Because not only um, do we have about 30% mm. of people that have a potential patent for Amen of Ale, but it changes during a person's lifetime. In other words, people may start off without one and end up with one. Mm. Um, so you, you can't just take a single uh, series of autopsies and draw a conclusion. What we do know is that children have a far higher uh, incidence of um, shunts or shunts between the upper chambers of the heart, the left and the right atrium, which is one of the reasons why we also encourage that younger divers shouldn't dive too deep. Mm. Um, so I hope that answers that part. Um, on the slide I showed you, I had to venture a guess because we don't know how many of the bubbles go through the heart versus the lung other than, and you'll see this uh, in the case that I'm presenting, if you inject bubbles into a vein and the bubbles appear very quickly, in the arterial circulation, you are most probably dealing with an intracardiac shunt. Stands to reason. You've just injected them and they immediately appear. So you probably have a patent for almond ovale. Mm. If it takes a while for those bubbles to come through, then it's usually related to a failure of the pulmonary bubble trap. Now, having said that, um, the contrast agent that is used in many studies in cardiovascular work uh, is very, very small in diameter. Uh, a red blood cell is 10 microns in diameter, and they uh, go through the uh, smallest blood vessels in the lung basically in single file. Mm. So bubbles that are or 
uh, contrast agents that are less than one mic uh, less than 10 microns would go through the lungs no matter what mm -hmm. that it would be normal for them to do so but what we usually do if we are looking for pfo is we create what we call blood bubble foam in other words you take nine cc's of salt water one milliliter of air and you basically make a nice slosh or solution and inject that because those bubbles are typically larger than a red blood cell. And even then, you do get some that go through the lung. So listen when we get to that uh, with a case a presentation that I'm about to give, and uh, perhaps that'll answer the question. But I think you've got the gist of it. Rapid appearance, then it goes through the heart. Slow appearance goes through the lung. Hmm. On average, probably 80% of the shunts are cardiac and 20% are related to the lungs. But those are figures that I'm really, you know, uh, almost sucking out of my thumb uh, because they are based on impressions. And it's very, very difficult to do objective uh, studies of shunting uh, within the lung. Good question, right. though. All right. Well, I think we'll keep the rest of the questions for a bit later, and then we can continue with the uh, presentation and the case studies. All right. So, well, here we go. And I hope that this uh, actually uh, addresses some of the uncertainties that we have. Now, not all of you are from South Africa. So there's a map of South Africa, and Volnerhat is a cave that has become shallower over the years as the water level has dropped. But... Um, uh, I would say about 20 years ago, uh, it was easily about 50 meters before you entered the cave. And there were a number of fatalities during that time. Now, this is not a fatality case. It's something else. But uh, that is still the venue where this takes place. So it's about 300 kilometers from Johannesburg, which is one of the largest uh, cities in South Africa. The diver was a young individual, engineer, intelligent, experienced, um, had been diving for 15 years, had done 450 dives without difficulties, was well trained as a sea mass diver and as a technical diver, had, had um, one previous uh, incident of decompression illness, but it was uh, joint related and uh, has nothing to do with the case that we're presenting now. Health status, no major issues other than mild sinusitis. Now I want to point out that sinusitis or um, uh, inflammation causing equalizing difficulties. In many ways, the sinuses and the ears are the safety net for the lungs. In other words, if you are suffering from an infection that causes you to have sinus pain or difficulty equalizing the ears, then that should be a warning sign that that same mucus may also be in the lungs. And that may have played a role in this particular case. Um, but we don't necessarily know that. But please do remember the fact that sinusitis or otitis um, uh, is not trivial and may be a warning sign for uh, other problems. And this was a single dive. So the individual on this particular day till in, in the morning went down to 40 meters. Uh, initially, there was a stop around 10 meters. I'll show you the profile shortly uh, just to check whether the sinuses were okay. The dive continued. Uh, the total dive time at that stage was 25 minutes. There were ascent alarms around 16 minutes. Oh, sorry, 16 uh, meters. And then ultimately, there was no breathing or coughing that would uh, lead one to suspect that there was a lung overpressure injury. So by and large, this is a pretty normal dive. And the only thing that stands out is that there's an underlying sinus uh, or potential sinus blockage and that there was 
at a fairly deep depth, um, maybe a faster ascent rate than the Aladdin computer would allow. But most people today would say that that in itself would not be a risk factor. So here's the dive profile. And you can see the individual around 10 meters checking the sinuses, making the dive down to 39 meters and then coming up to the surface and at 20 meters, and I want you to think about this, at 20 meters, the individual started experiencing uh, a sensation as if they were going to pass out. Now, we would not expect that, and this was an air dive, um, we would not expect something like that to happen at that depth but they already started with symptoms there and the symptoms increased until ultimately the person reached the surface. Okay, so a couple of things here. The first symptoms, as I say, between 20 and 15 meters were a feeling of impending blackout. Let me see if I can move myself out of the way here, then I can see the slide and look at you. Um, there was a transient spell of vertigo, which is often a warning sign of um, either uh, a rupture of, of the ear, which was not the case, or possibly bubbles passing, passing through. There was a painless loss of strength on the left arm and leg. And if one side of the body is affected, one starts thinking embolism or stroke. There were no visual disturbances, however. So bubbles weren't scattered throughout the brain, at least as far as we know at that stage. There was no improvement during the, the safety stop and the diver reached the surface, essentially paralyzed on the left side. So at this stage, is there anybody that like, would like to venture a guess of what they think is going on? Maybe we can just uh, pick out four or five if anybody's prepared to venture a guess. Okay, uh, let me just have a look, see if anybody is answering. Okay, stroke uh, comes up. And let's see, another one says stroke. So yeah, stroke seems to be uh, embolism, okay. another person said. Okay, embolism or stroke, it looks like that. Now, remember the aortic arch curls over, and I, I need to uh, realize I'm mirror imaged here, so I need to point the other direction. <laughs> um, the aorta, the way blood vessels leave the aorta, favors embolism of the right carotid artery, which would then lead to a left sided hemiplegia or paralysis. So that would be consistent with gas embolism. But having said that, why would it happen at 20 meters? This person hasn't even really thoroughly uh, gone through Haldane's two to one ratio at that stage. So having bubbles at 20 meters is something that is rather unusual. Okay, now the emergency management. Well, of course, we started with oxygen. Dan was called. It was a fairly complicated uh, um, evacuation, which ultimately resulted in an air evacuation to my hyperbaric unit. And um, uh, because there was a bit of a delay prior to the air evacuation, we could have the diver assessed at a nearby hospital. An x-ray was done to make sure that there wasn't a pneumothorax and they started with an infusion of lignocaine or lidocaine, which is one of the adjunctive treatments we use in the case of uh, serious spinal or, or uh, central nervous system decompression illness. The neurological signs were showing signs of some improvement. So the helicopter landed and left and ultimately the diver arrived at our chamber six hours after the first onset of symptoms, which all things considered, 
300 kilometers away and arranging an aeromedical evacuation isn't bad. It's a pretty, pretty good uh, um, rate of evacuation. At that stage, my assessment of the individual was consistent. They had weakness of the left arm and leg, and they were also making mistakes, or this individual was making mistakes on serial sevens, which is where we subtract seven from 100, and then seven from the answer, and then seven from the answer, and then seven from the answer. And it is a fairly sensitive test on whether a person has had some impact on, uh, on the brain. Of course, if they're very anxious, um, uh, they may not necessarily do the serial sevens very well just because they're anxious. But this individual was very calm and it was unusual for them to have that abnormality. Okay. So now, what would we do? Well, obviously, in this case, we would consider, given everything that we have, symptom onset, young individual, no prior history of high uh, blood pressure or family history of heart disease and stroke, uh, our working assumption was that this was bubble related and we started the individual on a US Navy treatment table six, which is 18 uh, meters or 60 feet for 75 minutes if it's not extended. And uh, by the beginning of the third session, the individual was able to move their left arm and leg and basically reported that it was normal. So we were very, very grateful that there was such a prompt response. We, we therefore, as is the recommendation, uh, completed the standard table, assessed the individual at the surface, and I checked for strength in the left leg and the left arm, and I really sort of uh, uh, imagined that there still was slight weakness uh, in uh, the left leg, but the arm, for all intents and purposes, was normal. So we admitted the individual for observation through the night if there was some change. And we then assessed them the next morning. Now, what I'm going to show you now is a series of slides that actually will show you some of the signs that we picked up. And with a little bit of luck, the videos that we spent a lot of time this afternoon getting to, to work uh, to, uh, to show you uh, the individual's progress. So here you see the person doing a heel to toe walk, and you can see he's actually doing reasonably well. This is the next morning, so it's after the first treatment, but it's not entirely normal. You can see there's a bit of swaying there. Okay. And here we're doing the Romberg test. I'll stop this one. Uh, well, you'll have to watch both, it seems. Well, anyway, I started the Romberg test and then made it even harder by doing what we call, and the German uh, gentleman listening might appreciate it, the Trittversuch von Unterberger, which is the step test of Unterberger. And what you're supposed to do is you basically mark time or you lift your, your feet up and down while closing your eyes. And there's a tendency to rotate if there's weakness on the one side. And I don't know whether you caught it right at the end, but the individual was having a battle maintaining their balance. Okay, so let's go to the next series of slides. We tested for vibration sense, and there was a reduction of vibration sense, uh, both uh, in the ankle and uh, the knee, but not in the arm. So it was both sensory as well as uh, motor, uh, uh, sensory um, uh, as well as vibration. So vibration sense as well as sharp uh, um, uh, sensation. 
The next slide. Here, I want you to watch very carefully. This is a reflex hammer over here. And watch what the foot does. I got the impression that the reflex was enhanced. Even in the arm, that's a pretty brisk reflex. And what I then did is I tested for a condition called clonus. And clonus is a form of spasticity. And you can see as I pushed up against the foot, it kept pushing down against my hand. That is a classic example of clonus. And notice that it was not only the left leg anymore, but it was now the right leg as well. So whatever started with a left hemiplegia had now evolved into a bilateral condition that involved the right leg as well as the left. Okay, this is uh, what we call the Babinski sign. I scratched the bottom of the foot and the first movement of the big toe, which is upwards, is positive, which means, again, evidence of a spinal or cerebral lesion. Okay, we've gone through those. And so now we wanted to test coordination, finger nose test. He needs to touch my finger. This is an engineer. So he was very, very well skilled with his hands. And uh, you will see why I considered that to be abnormal. So that's the finger nose test. This is what we call diadodokinesis, which is rapid alternating movements. And that was reasonably normal. And this is the shin slide test, which is also a coordination test. And although fairly hesitant, it was reasonably normal, although, uh, and it's imperceptible to you, there was a bit of a waving of the individual's leg as they did it. All right. So now, now we come to the questions. What now and what next? What's the diagnosis? Let's see if we can get five answers now. It started clearly like something that looked like a stroke or gas embolism, but now suddenly we also had involvement of the cerebellum and we had involvement of the right leg. So what is that? So we got a uh, brain tumor, uh, one, one uh, answer. Okay, remember the individual was perfectly normal prior to the event and a brain tumor would not present that quickly, but good attempt. D DCI, PFO. Okay, PFO, and if it were PFO, uh, it would explain the gas embolism, but why was there a subsequent effect on the right leg? The next and, morning, mind you, mm. after having been treated. Spinal lesion, blood shunt, uh, spinal bend, spinal embolism. Answers are okay. coming Okay. So we're now realizing that this is a combination. There is a gas embolism component, undeniably, with, the, with the left hemiparesis of the arm and leg. But we're now dealing with the other side of the body affected as well. And that was due to a spinal lesion. So should we continue with recompression? Is there anybody that says we shouldn't? I don't think so. <laughs> That's a good idea, and we did. Are there any special examinations that we could do? Well, I'll save you uh, what you probably would think of, and that is a brain scan. 
Hmm. Because we'd like to know what's going on with the brain. And even the spinal cord in certain units are able to take very, very high resolution scans of the, the spinal cord. But we couldn't at that stage. Remember, this was 2002. Any adjunctive therapy? Is there anything more we could give this individual? Um, well, it might be reasonable, although this person was fairly mobile, to uh, um, add lidocaine on the one hand because it was a serious event and also give the individual protection against blood clots in the legs. So we got him on stockings and we gave him blood clot uh, prophylaxis. How about future of diving? Mm. Well, it's premature, but uh, we are leaning, I think most of us listening to this are leaning towards probably not a good idea. Mm. I'll show you just for the sake of completeness, the chest x-ray, which was entirely normal. There was no evidence of bronchitis or anything that would suggest a lung overpressure injury. But now we move to the brain. And in the brain, and I don't expect you to, to see it too clearly, you will see lesions over here and over here. Sort of white spots in areas where you wouldn't expect them to be. That's still fairly subtle. So we used a, a more sophisticated test which is called the flare test. And that is able to distinguish carefully uh, between fluid that's always there and fresh fluid as a result of edema caused by an injury. And I think most of you can make out something here, something there, maybe something here, and something there. Something's not exactly right. We took it one step further, and this is what is called a fusion-weighted and perfusion-weighted imaging. What that means is we, we uh, set the magnetic resonance scanner in a way that it actually looks at blood flow, and it was able to pick up an abnormality in this particular area as well as on that particular area. So again, all of these things are consistent. But remember, so far, all we've looked at is the brain. We haven't looked at the cerebellum. And guess what we found in the cerebellum? All of these white spots are lesions. All of these are embolic lesions and explain the lack of coordination, the lack of balance, and many of the other symptoms or gross symptoms, but they don't explain fully why this person had the right uh, leg affected the way it was. Well, we were still looking for answers and maybe the person's lung function wasn't ideal. So we did a lung function test and the person's lung function, although it looks a little bit of, on the obstructed side, would still be classified as normal and acceptable. Normal and acceptable. And when we gave the individual an asthma pump, there was no change in their lung function. So in other words, their lungs were stable in that condition. So we did that additional test. And then, and I'm going to show you this slide first. Uh, let me just move back. Sorry. Move to this slide. We then looked whether blood concentration had occurred. And yes, there was a concentration of red blood cells. So we increased the amount of fluids that we were giving him. But CPK, which is basically an enzyme 
that is released when muscle damage occurs, which signifies or is one of the signals of arterial gas embolism was actually within the normal range. So it didn't fit with the typical gas embolism picture that Tom Newman and other people have found in California. So now I'll go back to the recompression we gave, and then I'll take you to the PFO assessment. Okay, so the recompression, come on, recompression, we carried on. And at this stage, we gave what we call HPO tables because it was convenient and even residual neurological damage tables because it's been shown that very high oxygen levels can sometimes be harmful for um, longer standing uh, uh, lesions of the brain. So we didn't want to overdo a good thing. So we carried on with this residual neurological damage table, which just to give you an idea, was essentially an hour at nine meters um, or 30 feet with a 30 minute slope to the surface. So we carried on with that. And we essentially uh, did a lot of them out of goodwill. And he had a total of 14 treatments over 14 days, including a full table six, an HBO table, and 12 of these re residual neurological tables. Mm -hmm. So we really gave it our best shot. Adjunctive therapy, and we mentioned the lidocaine and rehydration and then clot, uh, uh, preventing uh, clot formation. So this is now at the end of everything we did. This is him walking heel to toe now. Can't see the feet properly there, but you can see that there's far more control turn around and even though he's looking down rather than up which you would have preferred he's definitely better than he was <laughs> i hope you agree with me <laughs> this is the balance test just look at that last time he fell over And we did the sharpened Romberg test on him. And he didn't fall over anymore. So significantly better. But looking at his feet, we did that clonus test again. It's clear on this one. Can you see there's still that clonus? And this is the right leg. <clears throat> this is the right leg. Okay, and the positive Babinski sign, which is the toe lifting upwards as a first movement, which is typical of a spinal cord or a, uh, a brain lesion. Okay, so that leaves me with needing to answer the question, what was this? Oh, there's, just look at that, alternating movements, by the way. Just see how much faster it was now after the treatment. Let me go back. It's worth seeing again. Remember the first time it was a bit sluggish? Let's look at that. I mean, this guy is flipping it like uh, there's no tomorrow. <laughs> and the other side as well. And the shin slide was far more deliberate and on target than it was previously. So definitely improvement. But it still begs the question, what is this.
All right. Well, let me take you back to this. Two things. Firstly, the PFO assessment, and he underwent that same test that we gave the individual that you heard earlier. There's the injection now. So basically the bubble signals, although they started relatively early, there were late bubble signals as well. I don't know whether you heard them. Can maybe play it once more just for amusement. So the technique, just while you're listening, this individual's got the, we're sloshing the, the blood mixture. The person's holding a Valsalva and we inject as he releases the Valsalva. He's still holding Valsalva. And he's releasing the Valsalva within four seconds. And then later on, more bubbles. So does that give you any clue or any ideas or any questions you'd like to ask about this case? Let me just uh, have a look, see. Nothing coming through just yet, um, uh, Dr. Cronier. <clears throat> well, I want to take you back to, to <clears throat> the classification of decompression illness. And I want to point something out to you that you may not have realized before. So yeah, um, one uh, answer came through heart shunt as well as a lung shunt. Yes, I would agree. There, there were definitely um, components of both. But this was, in retrospect, what we now call type three decompression sickness. Remember, this is after all is said and done. The person's gone through all his treatments and we now have the luxury of making that diagnosis. Because the individual started with what seemed to be pure gas embolism resulting in paraplegia, but then ended up with a very resistant spinal cord decompression sickness. And this is a classic example of a very rare form of decompression sickness called type three, mm. which is where you start with a one, the shower of bubbles in the brain, and then later get uh, a, a lesion in the spinal cord. Mm. So, so uh, yeah, just some interesting feedback here. Blood-filled space in the spine. And uh, Adam says he was a double hit. Yes, it was a double hit. So it was, as you rightly say, gas embolism initially, and then a subsequent spinal cord injury that followed. Absolutely. Any other comments or questions? What? Well, while we wait for those, um, I think we should address uh, some of the ones that we didn't get to earlier, if that's fine. Sure. Or... Go ahead. All right. Let me have a look, see. What do we have here? So, um, Jonas wants to know, does the, uh, I think it's, he's asking if the temperature of the water plays any factor in uh, bubble making or, or bubble formation. 
Yes, thank you very much for that question. In this case, the water temperature is 19 degrees all the way down, which is quite reasonable. And this individual was actually diving with a dry suit, as I recall. So um, it wasn't a particularly significant factor, but what we suspect um, the worst uh, temperature change that one would have is if you start warm and then while the circulation is good, start becoming cold so that the inert gas stays trapped in the limbs and various parts of the body and then having uh, your ascent while you are still cold. Mm. That, that is the worst, let's call it outgassing model because as we know, um, a, a colder drink or a colder body will tend to hold gas back more readily than, um, than a warm body. Uh, but in this particular case, we did not suspect temperature to have played a significant role. And the person certainly didn't shiver uh, with the 23 minute dive. All right, um, got another question, uh, quite a nice one. Um, what would be the consequence of a delay of say uh, four days between a first and second recompression treatment with unresolved neurological DCI symptoms? Thank you in advance. Okay, well, I'm gonna take you to a slide that I showed you a little bit earlier because that uh, addresses this to some extent. Okay. It's this slide. The really, really rapid onset spinal symptoms, which this person didn't have, is where the bubbles form in the spinal cord. Then a little bit later, up to about six hours, it can be any combination of embolism, venous stasis, um, uh, bleeding in the bubbles, or ischemia of the spinal cord. But what you can sometimes get as a delay of several days is still some residual symptoms. And what we think is that represents an ongoing disruption of the blood-brain barrier. And these individuals, I have to say, we have sometimes decided to recompress and have been amazed and confused as to why they have done so well at a time where there is no possibility that there is any bubble left in the body. Hmm. I mean, at that stage, you're not treating bubbles anymore. You are treating the consequence of the bubbles. And nevertheless, the person shows an improvement. All right. Great stuff. Um, another question here. I'm not sure it's um, that relevant to this particular presentation, but here goes. So how much do we know currently about uh, recovered COVID patients returning to diving? I don't know if you want to answer that now or do we defer that, uh, Dr. Cronier? Yes, well, we don't have significant um, numbers that have returned to diving uh, that I know of, although... Uh, I can tell you that I have passed three uh, post-COVID patients, uh, one, of, one of which was actually um, on a ventilator in the ICU. Um, and we were comfortable that the, uh, the x-rays and the lung functions had returned basically to normal and the individual's exercise capability was pretty much back to 90% of normal. And uh, this is a special task force, police task force diver um, that we were assessing. So he hasn't dived since I passed him fit. So I can't tell you what the outcome is, but I was comfortable passing this individual as fit. Mm. And I think as time goes on, we will probably have uh, lessons uh, in terms of changes of x-rays, whether there's a need for additional tests and whether uh, lung function tests are adequate to distinguish those who are at a greater risk for subsequent problems than others. 
we do have some concerns that scarring of the lungs predisposes individuals to gas embolism. And we obviously are somewhat concerned of this so-called ground glass appearance um, that uh, has been reported in Innsbruck uh, in the lungs, because we don't know long-term what the outcomes will be. So that's a very long-winded, I don't know. Okay. All right. Well, here's another question. Uh, do you get many hits in South Africa on multiple deep dives? Let's say three uh, dives deeper than 24 meters on a single day with normally less than 90 minutes surface time. Well, thank you very much for that question. And the answer is um, that a dive computer actually can only truly calculate gas movement, and remember, it's still theoretical, for a single dive. Once you've done a second dive, it's really starting to guess. By the time you get to the third dive, it's really almost making up the numbers. And I, I don't mean, mean to uh, insult the dive computer manufacturers, but those that know the diving algorithms will admit that we have no idea how inert gas at that stage is moving between compartments and, uh, and the credits that you get. Mm. A surface interval of 90 minutes, um, I would uh, certainly recommend though, uh, because that does eliminate uh, the uh, majority of bubbles. Uh, we know that the greatest um, appearance of bubbles that is on Doppler is within the first two hours of a dive. So if you look at, at that in terms of a decompression stress, then at least 90 minutes is fairly close to two hours. And so I think that at that stage, one is probably a lot closer to uh, the dive model that you use than you would have been if you had done it with a shorter surface interval. Mm. So I hope that answers the question, mm. but um, uh, the reality is dive computers simply cannot keep track of the complexities of gas movement beyond a single dive. Mm. All right, well, we're getting quite a lot of questions in. So um, I think uh, uh, unless you have additional slides, Masra, we can hit another 10 minutes or so, otherwise it gets uh, a bit late, but, um, yeah, goes. So do any of the scenarios change the recommendations to administer oxygen if DCI is suspected? So I think that relates back to some earlier slides, um, Dr. Knier. Ah, so um, uh, let me just sharpen the question and make sure that I've got it right. Uh, is there any reason not to give normal baric oxygen for fear of maybe um, causing there to be gaps in the spinal cord that can be filled with blood? Is, is that the nature of the question? Um, I don't know. This was quite early on, so it might be related to something else. Uh, let me just see. Uh, uh, hold on. <clears throat> uh, I will, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you the, the bottom line answer as far as uh, okay. oxygen is concerned. Okay. We are very comfortable with individuals getting close to 100% oxygen continuously at the surface for a period of 16 hours with a couple of bathroom breaks and the inevitable uh, breaks uh, that will happen. And it does not impact on a subsequent recompression treatment. So up to 16 hours and oxygen supplies very rarely last that long. So... Yeah. You're going to run out of oxygen uh, before you're go going to get into trouble. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable uh, answer. And uh, if that wasn't it, uh, please just re-ask uh, the question again. Next one is, how about skin rash? How soon after a dive does this occur? Ah, a very, very good question. And the answer is, it depends on a number of, uh, number of conditions or number of reasons. It depends on the amount of adipose tissue. I don't want to use the F, the fat word. Okay, <laughs> so the amount of adipose tissue 
And it also depends to some extent on the number of bubbles that actually make their way through the lungs. So those are the two variables that seem to be uh, most closely related to the appearance of uh, a skin rash. And I would be remiss in saying that there is also an association uh, between uh, a very rapid onset skin rash, and with that I mean within 10 to 15 minutes, and uh, a shunt, a significant shunt, okay. usually in the heart. Mm. All right. Great. So uh, next question, COVID related again, uh, any increase in incidents post COVID, any new related risks or health questions to ask divers? Um, well, I'll allow you to answer. Yes. Well, um, I'd answer you with the usual pragmatic answer that, you know, doctors tend to offer. And that is that we would want the chest X-ray to uh, have recovered, to show no evidence of scarring, because that's a known risk factor. The lung functions to have returned virtually back to normal and exercise capability return to normal. If those three things are normal, then there is very little reason to believe that the individual is at an untoward greater risk. Uh, time will tell, but that's my working hypothesis at the moment. All right, great stuff. Um, will the webinar be uh, available afterwards? Yes, it will, so that's all good. Uh, what is the likely um, incidence of, oh, sure, I don't know, patent ductus causing DCI and are they associated with migraines? I don't know if that's okay. maybe PFO, but yeah. Yeah, that's a very, that's a very good question. Mm. Um, and um, I, the, I've actually got a presentation on YouTube on PFO that visits this, yeah. that goes into the details of the size and the bubbles, et cetera, et cetera, and, and when it should be closed or could be closed. So um, please look up my YouTube on PFO or, or another reputable source. Okay. Um, but we tend to um, favor the closure of a PFO if the person has significant migraines and especially if they also have episodes of transient ischemic attacks. In other words, uh, uh, virtual strokes that uh, recover on their own. Okay. If those two conditions are there, we are far more aggressive in closing PFOs. In terms of the percentage of PFOs, as I mentioned, it varies, unfortunately. Um, in the autopsy, the famous autopsy series, uh, it was about a quarter of individuals, but we know now that that can change during the course of a person's lifetime. All right, great stuff. I've made a note just to add uh, the links to those uh, lectures you uh, referred to. So uh, in the follow-up email tomorrow, um, you know, those will be available. So fantastic on that. Um, next question, can free diving be beneficial for scuba divers where gas consumption and tolerance to CO2 is, in, uh, is a concern? Uh, I don't know if that uh, mm. works for you. Well, I, I've got a very, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Yeah. Uh, free divers have or develop a high tolerance to carbon dioxide. One of the concerns we have is that scuba divers that uh, also have a fairly low tolerance to carbon dioxide tend to skip breathe more readily. And we know that that is a potential risk factor for decompression illness. Yeah. Now there are no hard numbers and I doubt that uh, the if we were to do a study that we will get significant uh, differences. Um, but theoretically, at least, free divers that have a high tolerance to CO2 will also be more likely to underbreathe and thereby build up CO2 and in the process uh, be more likely to accumulate slightly more inert gas 
than an individual with a low tolerance level to CO2? Um, okay, uh, there's a question here just about the diver that passed away at Busman's Hut in the northern uh, Northern Cape. I don't think it's Northern Cape, but anyways, was this also a technical diver? So I think, um, you know, if I remember, we've, we've got a detailed, we've got a detailed um, summary of of that, mm. and in fact, there's a book with the yeah. name called Ra um, "Raising the Dead." Correct. And uh, that book is the whole blow-by-blow blow account of uh, that particular incident. Okay. I was directly involved. Dr. Jack Mankies was actually on site. And uh, we were involved with the subsequent research and also uh, the discovery of the reasons for respiratory failure mm -hmm. when uh, entrapment occurred. It was clearly a technical dive and it was to 280 meters. So it is, on all accounts, a high-risk technical dive. All right, great stuff. So um, if someone has had DCI, does it increase the susceptibility uh, in the future? Another good question. Mm. Uh, and the famous medical answer is, it depends. <laughs> uh, and it depends really on two things. The one is, if you tend to, if you get, for instance, a decompression illness in a joint as a result of a very long decompression uh, from a long technical dive, mm. that does not predispose you to getting decompression illness of the spinal cord or another part of the body. And in fact, not even necessarily the same joint. So my glib and quick answer is that different types of decompression illness hmm. um, are, are, not, uh, uh, are not related in terms of risk. Yeah. If an individual, however, has had an incident of, for instance, a gas embolism picture, then there very definitely is a risk. And I, I'm sad to say that I witnessed, uh, in fact, the, the individual uh, showing the rash with the cutis marmorata. He had a PFO. Four months later, against medical advice, went diving and subsequently died in the chamber mm. as a result of fatal uh, gas complications. So... Mm. Uh, that's why I say it depends. Okay. Different areas of the body, risks don't necessarily transfer, but if it is in the same area of vulnerability, then yes, there is an increase in risk. All right. So um, my sinuses hate uh, air conditioning. So on a dive boat, I normally take a 12-hour decongestant first thing in the morning, normally for a week with a two-day break uh, or two-day between weeks break, I guess. Um, is this bad for my health? Well, um, in, in terms of the risk to the lungs, uh, I would say that it is, uh, it's unlikely that the concern I had with an upper respiratory tract infection uh, affecting the sinuses and the middle ear being the safety net for the lung. Uh, I would distinguish that risk from the risk you're referring to, which mm. is really irritation of the upper airways mm. and has nothing to do with the lungs. The lungs are not really affected by that. By that time, the air is humidified and warmed and uh, would not cause a problem. Okay. If you use topical decongestants, um, or overuse them either in terms of dosage or in terms of duration, they may be harmful. Mm. If you overuse them in terms of dosage, in other words, you give yourself um, seven squirts per nostril, well, it's, it's like adrenaline. So it will increase your heart rate and the risk of arrhythmias and a loss of consciousness even. Mm and certainly an increase in blood pressure, which runs the risk of stroke. Mm -hmm. So overdosing will have that risk. 
And the second aspect is if you use it for more than five days continually, there is what we call the risk of medic uh, rhinitis medicamentosa, which basically means the blood vessels of your nasal passages have had enough and they no longer respond to the medication. Mm. And it sometimes takes quite a while for them to get back to normal. Yeah. In spite of you, uh, in spite of ongoing use of decongestants, they just simply don't work anymore. Okay. All right. I think uh, Dr. Crenier, there's still quite a few questions, um, but it is getting a bit late. So I don't know if you're still keen, uh, but here's a nice one uh, possibly to end off with. It uh, does exercise have any uh, significant impact on the formation of bubbles before and after diving? That is a mammoth question. And there are various ways to look at it. We know that exercise 24 hours prior to diving is protective. We know that um, exercise done within the first four hours after a dive, after reaching the surface, significantly increases the risk of developing decompression illness. And we know that exercise during decompression is a safety factor. So exercise during decompression is good. Exercise 24 hours before is definitely good. We don't know um, in ranges, let's say within six hours of diving, whether the tribonucleation, you know, the, the, the uh, um, vacuoles that you can form possibly could increase the risk. Mm. I think it will probably be offset by the increase of heat shock protein. So I doubt there would be a significant risk, but there definitely is a risk for the first four hours after a dive. And the last thing you want to do is be is picking up heavy equipment for the first two hours after a dive, especially if it's a significant dive where you can expect significant um, uh, precordial bubbles. All right. So I'll end off with the last question here. And I'm sorry to all the other folks, but I don't think we'll end this evening if we keep going. But what we'll do is uh, I'll collect those questions and um, you know discuss them with Dr. Cronier and do our best to um, respond to you via email with the questions you had. Um, so the last one is, what time period after the incident will you expect to see first abnormalities on an MRI? Ah, oh. the, the answer is you'll actually see them immediately. Uh, the disruption of circulation will immediately show uh, abnormalities. And then as the disease progresses or the condition progresses, you'll just see different types of pathophysiology. So in the beginning, you might actually see bubbles. And then you'll start seeing edema. And then you'll start seeing inflammation. Uh, and so it uh, depends very much when you do the examination. But the abnormalities will clearly be visible. Just to give you um, an indication of how sensitive it is, Recently, a test has actually been uh, developed using a pulse oximeter. In other words, uh, a thing that you usually attach to a finger to say what the saturation of hemoglobin to oxygen is in the blood. And they've attached it to the earlobe, and they've actually found that there is, with a certain monitor, there is a drop in oxygen saturation in individuals who have patent foramen ovales. Very large ones, but nevertheless, a uh, significant chance. So uh, a very simple test actually already shows some abnormalities. Fantastic, I hope that answers the question. Dr. Cronier, thank you so much uh, for your time, the amazing presentation. Um, you know, I think for the most part, I've been getting uh, really great feedback, uh, you know, people thanking you for the very informative webinar, 
loving it and so forth. Others uh, most probably were expecting something different, but for the most part, um, everybody seems to be very excited and, and happy with it. From my side, thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it as well. I certainly had a great time and I look forward to um, uh, you know more presentations. Uh, Stephen says, excellent presentation, invaluable information, first class, well done. So kudos to you, Dr. Cronier, as usual. Um, but um, yeah, I think we also just need to thank all the folks that joined us uh, for sticking around. Um, it's great to have you. I know everybody from all around the world, uh, you know, uh, sometimes the time uh, uh, factor isn't easy. So thank you for sticking around and just know that the uh, replay link will be available. And for all the Dan supporters, um, great to have you on board as always. Uh, just uh, a little heads up uh, tomorrow in the follow-up email, I'll add some of the uh, links and, and information that Dr. Cronier was um, uh, talking about. Uh, but just to give you a hint, there'll be some sort of guides, uh, smart guides, alert diver magazines, the alert uh, or annual reports uh, Dr. Cronier spoke about. I'll also give you access to the uh, diving safety portal that's got about eight hours plus worth of lectures, audio podcasts, and so forth that you can work through at your own leisure along with some of those PFO um, uh, uh, lectures that Dr. Cronier spoke of. So, you know, from our side, it's been great. Thank you very much. And Dr. Cronier, maybe you have some closing or parting words uh, or advice for the folks. Thank you, Mornay. I just want to uh, remind or maybe direct uh, individuals who were maybe expecting something else in terms of uh, more cases, uh, et cetera, et cetera, if you look at the uh, diving, uh, Dan, uh, diving injury uh, report and fatality report, there are more than enough vignettes, more than enough cases that uh, actually explain where and how things went wrong. And I would like to encourage you to have a look at those because they are far more detailed than I would be able to cover um, uh, and I think more useful than showing you a, a a couple of oddballs. I chose deliberately a very complex case because it really had us thinking. And I hope that in doing that, I achieved what I hope to do, which is bundle all those cases into one and get you thinking in all the necessary directions. And with that, safe diving. And uh, thank you so much. We really uh, are very gratified by your interest and thank you for staying. Yeah, well, Dr. Cronier, thank you. And thanks to everybody. That brings us to the end of the, uh, the webinar. I hope to see you in the future webinar series uh, from our side. Safe diving, stay healthy. And until next time, cheerios. <laughs>